morning. We did have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving banquet uh, this past uh, Friday night. It was great to have everyone there, and thank you to everyone that um, worked that event. I was uh, texting with Julie uh, late that evening, and you know we had about 200 people here. It was 194 people, which is great. Uh, turnout, and I uh, was just thanking Julie and those others. So if you were in the kitchen, I know that was a lot of work, and we just appreciate everything that you did. Julie was telling me that she was like, we had a lot of fun, but I'm glad it only happens once a year. So, <laughs> uh, but I uh, just really enjoy that time. Um, and obviously with Walk Through Bethlehem coming up, there's a lot to pray for. Uh, so uh, actually, Samuel, can you pass out those cards right there? So uh, Tracy asked me to make sure that everyone gets some cards. So Samuel's going to walk around. Maybe um, Austin, if you can help him when you're done ushering, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, just passing out some cards that you guys can hand out when you're, you know, out in uh, the area. You can let people know about Walk Through Bethlehem. Uh, my aunt was at a, at a fundraiser uh, a couple weeks ago, and she sent me a picture, and she said, look what I was just handed at the fundraiser. It was a Walk Through Bethlehem card. And so they're out everywhere. So uh, just continue to let everybody know. Uh, and then 18 days 18 days. So I would just ask you that every day for the next two and a half weeks that you would be praying for three things. That you would pray first for the 6,000 people that are going to come through, walk through Bethlehem, that they would hear the gospel plainly presented to them and they would know how to respond. That God would speak to their heart, that he would draw them to him and that their life would be changed. Many people will have never have made a decision for Christ and we would pray that they would come to know the Lord and then others that maybe have drifted from him would be able to rededicate their life to him. So pray for that every day. Pray for everyone that, will be, uh, that is currently working in the city and trying to uh, get us prepared. And pray for all the people that are going to be acting and cast members in the city during Walk Through Bethlehem so that God will give them strength. But just a wonderful time for us to be able to sow and you know, evangelize into our community uh, coming up here in a couple weeks. So we're very excited about that. We'd like to maybe just open our service with prayer this morning, and then we'll dive into our, our message today. Father, we do come to you today, and we are so grateful for your Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for your Son, God, and we're grateful for your Word. We pray, Lord, that today you would speak to us, that your Spirit would be so clear and plain. God, that we would hear your voice. We would understand your Word. God, we would know what you are calling us to do. Father, reveal to us your truth. Speak to us through your Spirit today. Help us to hear you. God, and to know the steps and actions that we would need to be taking as we go forward from here. Help us to realize the importance of your word and the role that it plays in our life and our ability to stand firm against the enemy. We thank you for everything, Lord God, and we worship you uh, today in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we talked about the helmet of salvation, actually. So uh, we are coming down to uh, nearly the end of our series. Next week we're going to be wrapping up our Bulletproof series. We're going to be talking about... Uh, the full armor of God, but really where Paul says at the end of the passage in Ephesians 6, he says, and now pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And so <clears throat> we're going to talk about the role of praying in the Spirit and what that means and why it's important and, uh, and how it activates the armor of God. So looking forward to what next week will be, and then we'll be spending time in December talking about uh, obviously Christ and his birth and its significance. And then in the next year, a lot of great uh, things coming there. But last week, we talked about the helmet of salvation. And we said that salvation is that glorious exchange of our sin and the punishment for our sin, uh, for God's righteousness, for his love, for his grace and his mercy. But it means nothing unless we put that, that helmet of salvation on. That salvation protects the battlefield of our mind. And the way that we put our helmet on is first we uh, have to operate with an eternal perspective and a godly focus. I can't be focused on this moment. I can't be focused on what makes me feel good right now. I need to be focused on where I'm going and where God is taking me and leading me for all of eternity. I need to reject doubt. I need to confront that doubt. Uh, and, and I do that with truth. And we're going to be talking about the truth of God's word today and the role that it plays there. Uh, we know that we have to take every thought captive. And that means that when I have to be aware of <clears throat> the thoughts and temptations that come into my mind that are not aligned with God's word, his will, his direction, his voice, his spirit. And when I recognize that one of those thoughts has come against me, that I, I literally take that thought and I make it captive and I make it obedient to Christ. And that takes discipline. We know that putting our helmet on means that we renew our mind. And then obviously we talked about the fact that, you know, I have to actually, when the world sees me, they need to see that I'm wearing a helmet of salvation 
and not a helmet of worldliness. I have to walk in the salvation that I've been uh, given and that I've received in the Lord. Now, some of you, you're like, you've been waiting for today. Like, we've been talking about def- defense long enough. You want to talk about offense, right? Right? Well, I mean, but here's the deal. Defense wins championships, right? I mean, if you know anything about football, defense wins championships. And the thing that I think we need to realize, when Paul is talking about the armor of God, first, he, he gives us plenty to understand about the defensive elements of the armor of God. But we cannot miss the fact that Paul says that our role in battle is to stand firm. God is the one fighting for us. Okay, so not only is the sword an offensive tool, it is a defensive tool. And what we're going to understand today is the role that it plays in both, in both elements. And so I'm very excited about that. Now, one thing that, you know, I'm going to say, I hope I don't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways, that I believe, and as a church, we believe that God's word or the Bible is God's infallible word. And the reason I think it's important to say that, listen, there are churches that don't believe that. There are pastors that don't believe that. And I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I just want you to know where I stand. I want you to know where we as a church stand. The Bible is God's infallible word. That means it is 100% correct. Every single word in this book is true. Every single word. And I know that because of God, he, and I think about Moses, right? God inspired the writers of the Bible with his words to talk about his truth and his direction and his will. Moses, he wrote the book of Genesis, but the things that happen in the book of Genesis happened 2,500 years before Moses was even born. How could he do that? Only through the Holy Spirit of God telling him what to write. Isaiah, he prophesied about things. He named kings that would be doing things from a historical perspective before those kings were born. He could only do that through the Holy Spirit of God speaking to him about what happened. And because that's true, I know that what it says about what's going to happen in the future is true as well. God's word is 100% true. It is absolutely his word. It is inerrant. And it is something that we use to to understand more about who he is and his love for us. The Bible talks often about its own purpose and and, and the power that that it possesses. In 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we, what I love here, you know, Paul is instructing Timothy, a young pastor, on the importance of God's word. And he says to Timothy, you have known the scriptures since infancy, since infancy. I mean, can you imagine how your life would be different if since infancy, from a time that you were a baby, that you were intimate with God's word. In another translation, which we're going to read later, it says that you took in the scriptures with your mother's milk. What a beautiful picture that that paints and the importance of having, that, of having God's word as part of our life from a very early age. And one of the things that we see here is Paul is telling Timothy, not only have you taken it in since you were an infant, but you must continue down the path that you have learned and have been convinced of. I love this picture because what it, what it tells me is that God has given us his word. And it, there, are, there are words here like in Acts when, when it says that the early church, what they did every day, they continued in the teaching of the apostles. And that that teaching was specific to the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to think about it in the context of a news story, Right? It doesn't make sense for us to hear a news story and then repeat that news story every single day so that we can become intimate with the story of something that happened in the news. But the, the people in the early church, what they understood was that this was more than just a news story. This was a way of life. This was a change and a transformation that needed to come into them. And the way that they understood that and the way that they walked in that transformation is they continued down the path 
that they have learned and been convinced of. Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, wrote in um, Cost of Discipleship, he talks about the fact that the goal of teaching any subject is to make the teaching itself superfluous. Let me give you an example. How many of you, when you were asked what two plus two is, if I were to say that, how many of you would need a teacher to come in and now reteach you what you learned in elementary school? I see some people looking at people. You know, there might be some doubt happening over in this section over here. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, the point is, right, we, we don't need to relearn that fact over and over and over again, right? So the goal of teaching is to make that superfluous. But what, what um, Bonhoeffer says is that studying Scripture, being taught Scripture, will never become superfluous. It will always be relevant. It will always be important. Repetition is required. Repetition is required. The important thing or what we have to realize is that requires focus. It requires uh, discipline. It requires prioritization. And it requires us to sacrifice some things that, that simply are not as important as God's word. You know, time is finite. We all are only given 24 hours a day. And what we choose to do with our time demonstrates to God and demonstrates to others what we say is important in our life. So if you say that you don't have time to read the Bible, no, you're not making time to read the Bible. It's an important understanding. And listen, I'm not, you know what? I am trying to make you feel bad, all right? I'm not gonna say that I'm not. I want you to understand the power of God's word, the importance of God's word, and in the importance of repeating and studying God's word. How many of you have ever heard a scripture or read a scripture that maybe you learned as a child, one that you could even recite off the top of your head, but you heard it or read it on, an, on, a, on any given day and you learned or saw something new? Anybody ever have that happen? I mean, you guys have witnessed that happen to me while I'm preaching to you. Right? And so the, you have to realize the importance that it's not just let me read it one time and I'm done. No, I must stay, I must continue in what I have been, what I have learned of and been convinced of. Let's put it in the context of battle. So this is a beautiful uh, sword that Steve is letting me use. And now the importance of having a sword, right? And some people are scared and my, my mom is scared too. She's like, John, you're too clumsy to be holding a sword that has a, has a point on it. And she's right. But uh, so I put it back in its sheath just for, for safety. But um, if I was in battle, and let's say I walked out onto battle, I've got my full armor on, right? And I'm going out to battle, and I know that I have a sword. I know that my sword is sharp. I know that my sword is with me. I know that it can protect me. I know that it's useful. In fact, I know that it's useful because two weeks ago when I was in a battle, I used it. And I believe that when I use that uh, against the enemy that I faced two weeks ago, that's going to protect me against the enemy that I face today. Does that make sense? It's laughable to think that I, I believe that when I use a sword two weeks ago, it's going to protect me against the enemy that's attacking me in this moment. No, every moment that I face the enemy, I must unsheath my sword. Every moment that I'm engaged in battle, I must be prepared. And yet so often... We say, well, I learned that scripture on Sunday and I'm, I'm gonna expect that I haven't studied it and I haven't become intimate with it, that on Friday when the devil comes against me, that I'm gonna be safe and secure. Just simply knowing that I have the sword does nothing for me unless I take the sword out and use it. And the important thing that we must realize is the question, or the question that I want to ask you, how often are you reading your Bible? How often are you studying it and digesting it and meditating on it? How often? You see, Jesus, he was intimate with the word of God. We're going to talk later today that the devil knew the word of God. And so we must make this a priority in our life. One of the things that we have to understand, you know, through all of this, is going into the battle with the mentality that we talked about makes no sense whatsoever. One thing that I want you to recognize, so a few weeks ago, Steve talked about the fact that when we, we have our shield of faith, right? And the shield is the heaviest piece of armor. And when we are tired, what do we do first? We drop the shield 
And the devil knows that if he gets us engaged in battle and we continue to, to continue to fight, and when we get tired, our faith wanes and we, we become weak and we drop it. Will you, do, do you know how to get your faith back? The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word of God. So when I have dropped my shield of faith, when I am weak in my faith, the sword will help me pick it up. The sword will help me pick it up. It's so important. We must operate. We must live with a passion for the word of God. The psalmist uh, who wrote Psalm 119 understood this. Psalm 119 is the longest passage in in all of scripture. It's 176 verses. And the psalmist loved God's word so much that what he did is he wrote an acrostic poem. That means that of those 176 verses, they are broken down into 22 stanzas of eight verses each. And the reason that there are 22 stanzas is because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And it's, it's almost as if the psalmist is saying, how much do I love God's word? Let me count the ways. A is for this, B is for that, C is for this, D is for that, E, F, G, all the way through. He's writing, and every single stanza starts with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet because he is passionate about the word of God. And as we dive in to what Psalm 119 says, I spent some time this week reading through, and I want to highlight for you some of the more, uh, you know, just to me, the ones that speak to me, and hopefully they will speak to you as well. In verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In verse 14, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. In 16, it says, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times, at all times. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. I have chosen the way of, right, of faithfulness. I have set, set my heart on your laws. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. How I long for your precepts and your righteousness preserve my life, never Never, never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I reach out to your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. Most of us at midnight, we're rising to go to the bathroom. This guy's rising at midnight to thank God for his righteous laws. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. A few key themes are highlighted here. We obviously see a great desire for the word of God. He says that his soul is consumed, that he stays awake through the night, that he awakes at midnight, that he reaches out for the commands. He says, God, never take your decrees from me, and he talks about how he longs, his soul longs for the word of God. He says that the, that the law, the word of God is useful for direction. He says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, that it is you know, a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. It's useful for direction and understanding, preservation of life and attainment of hope. He talks about its value. It's worth more than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. It is sweet, sweeter than honey in his mouth. And it brings contentment and filling, fulfilling. It says that it brings peace. It's the theme of his song wherever he lodges. And his words, God's word, is his delight. Why is it so important? Why is God's word so important? Well, we can look back to what it says in Timothy because Paul said that every word of scripture comes from the mouth of God, that it is breathed by him. And what we understand here is that when God breathes on something, what does he give it? He gives it life. 
Because he breathed into Adam and Adam rose. Jesus, in John chapter 14, he's talking to his disciples. And it's the night of his arrest. And he does something that in our culture might seem a little strange. But he's there with his disciples and he breathes on them. And he says, I have breathed on you so that you might have the Holy Spirit. Because what we see is in God's breath is his spirit and his spirit brings life. So last week when we talked about walking and living with an eternal focus, the only way that I can do that is when I'm focused on his word, when I'm, in, when I'm ingesting and digesting his word, when I'm living in a relationship with him. Because when I do that, I am empowered, I'm infused with his spirit, with his life, and with his power. This is so important for our walk. We must pursue it. We must engage with it. It brings life. Proverbs give us, gives us a little bit of a picture of this. It says uh, that the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. But we get a beautiful and a much more in-depth understanding of that in Deuteronomy 8. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for these 40 years to humble you and test you in order uh, to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And you might say, well, it seems a little cruel that God would lead the people into the wilderness and intentionally make them hungry. But why? What does it say? When Moses is, is speaking these words in Deuteronomy, why is he saying that God led you into the wilderness and made you hungry? He did that to make them humble. I think it's a sad state that after 400 years of slavery, they still had to be made humble. That they came out of Egypt with a sense of entitlement. That they came out of Egypt expecting God to just meet their need rather than worshiping God for meeting their need, rather than surrendering to God for everything that he had already done. No, God had to make them humble. And the way that he made them humble was to realize, I'm hungry, but my life doesn't come from this bread. My life doesn't come from this manna, which I don't even know what it is. My life comes from God because man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's word is life. It is critical. It, it is necessary for us. God is our provider. We must be dependent on him. I, for one, never, will I never want to have to learn that lesson. I don't want God to look down on me and say, John needs to be humbled. What a scary place to be. I want to live my, my life with my hands held high in worship thanking God for what he has done and pursuing him through a relationship and by engaging in his word. What we also see is that while we are engaging with the word of God, that, that the Bible will teach us how to use it. And Jesus was a master. He was a master at using the word of God. He used scripture to talk about his calling. He used scripture to talk about his purpose. He used scripture to deliver his message and he used scripture to stand firm against the enemy. In Matthew chapter 3, we see a picture of Jesus. He is baptized, and as he comes up out of the water, what happens? The Holy Spirit of God in the form of a dove comes down and lights upon Christ, and God booms from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And what happens? The Holy Spirit, it says in Matthew chapter 3, that the Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. And so Jesus, he is in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without food, without drink, and he is hungry. My son can't go 40 minutes without food, without being hungry. He's saying amen. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is, like, Jesus is 100% is God, but he's also 100% man. And so in his flesh, he has become weak. And the devil says, I'm going to use this moment to attack him. I'm going to use this moment to tempt him. And so he shows up on the scene and he says, Jesus, I know you're hungry. Turn these, these pieces of stone, turn these rocks into bread and eat. And Jesus, he quotes the scripture that we just read. It says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus understood that God had made 
him hungry. That he knew where he would be dependent. And the devil was not satisfied with this. And so he takes Jesus to the top of the temple. And he says, hey, Jesus, if you're going to use scripture against me, I'm going to use scripture against you. Doesn't it say in the Bible that if, if you really are the son of God, that he's not going to let your foot, you know, break against a stone? He uses scripture. It says in Matthew 4, 6, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He uses, he quotes Jesus for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. How does Jesus respond? He says, it is also written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil realizes he might be overmatched when it comes to an intimate knowledge of God's word. And so he takes Jesus to a high mountain. And he says, okay, Jesus, all of this can be yours. All you have to do is bow down to me. I don't know, I kind of think it's funny that the devil's trying to give Jesus something that Jesus made. But the thing is, you know, God, these temptations are interesting. Because God, you know, Jesus, he had to be tempted in this way, in his flesh, for hunger and his pride because the devil said, if you really are the son of God. And here the devil is tempting Jesus in his materialism or his desire to pursue worldly things instead of God. Because all of this was promised to Jesus anyway. And in Revelation, it says that all of this is going to be given to Christ at, at, at that point in the future. The devil just basically says, I'll give it to you now, but you must bow down to me. And, it, and Jesus again answers with scripture. He says, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is a familiar passage. We've talked about it, you know, even in here before. But something I want to just share a few quick, you know, themes and things that we must understand. That first, the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. What that tells me is that this temptation had to occur. This, this, this interaction between Jesus and the devil had to happen. Because in Hebrews, it says that Jesus is our high priest and he has been tempted in every way that we are, but what? He did not sin. You see, this interaction allowed us to observe Christ being tempted in the ways that we are tempted, but overcoming that temptation. Second, we see that the devil attacked Christ in the place of his weakness, in the place of his perceived weakness, I should say, his flesh. Because he waited until Jesus had fasted for 40 days. And he came and he attacked him in that place and said, I know you're hungry. What that tells me is that he is, the devil will attack me when I am weak. That the devil is going to find those times when my faith might be wavering, when, when you know, I might be overcome with worry or doubt or whatever. And he's going to hit me the hardest in those times. The third thing that I think is so beautiful in this passage is that Jesus, I mean, he could have said, Hey, devil, don't you know who you're messing with? He could have said, in the power of my name, you get out of here. He could have called angels down from heaven. He could have said, by the authority of my father, who said, let there be light, and the one who created you, devil, get out of here. But you know what he did? The devil, or excuse me, Jesus fought this battle in the same place that the devil was attacking him. He fought this battle in his flesh. He overcame the devil. He overcame temptation in his flesh. Why? So that you and I, when we see that we are tempted, we can go to the same place that Christ went. I can go to this word and I can know that my salvation is secure. I can know that I can overcome that temptation because God's word will see me through. Jesus, he didn't, he didn't want to demonstrate his deity in this moment. He wanted to demonstrate his humanity so that we could all know that we could overcome temptation as well. Such a powerful picture. What we must realize is I don't overcome temptation in my strength. I don't overcome temptation in my power. I don't even overcome temptation in my knowledge. I overcome temptation because I have an intimate relationship with God and an intimate understanding and relationship with his word by wielding the sword of the spirit. Somebody needs to say amen louder than that. Come on. It's a beautiful understanding of where God 
is wanting us to realize the importance of his word. So what I want to do in the next few moments is I want to shift a little bit from preaching to teaching. So I, I've told you before over the last several weeks, we've been doing a, an exercise on Wednesday nights um, talking about how to study the Bible. We've been talking about different tools that we use uh, and can use in doing that. And, and honestly, like, I'll be completely honest with you. I didn't read this in a book, okay? This is something that uh, a few years ago, we were at camp with the students. I was out uh, next to Chris Pernat. He and I were talking while he was grilling up some lunch. And before I knew it, I was surrounded by 25 teenagers. And they looked at me and they said, John, we want to know how to study the Bible. And so what we did when we got home, uh, we opened our home on Sunday evenings and we invited those teenagers in and we studied the Bible together. And we went through and we used these tools to help us do that. You can use one of them, you can use all of them, but listen, don't go out there. Don't, don't assume that you can just read and, and, and read alone, not study, not engage with the word and be impacted by it. God wants us to, to, to not read this as if it were just a book, this is his love letter to us. Imagine, you know, in the first times, you know, when you, were, when you were dating your spouse and you would get some kind of correspondence from them, how many times would you pour over that? How many times would you listen to it? I used to give Melanie a hard time. When we met, she had, like, I mean, cell phones have come a long way, right, in the last 13 years. And I don't remember what old phone she had, but she had like an old phone. We all had old phones back then, like flip phones, you know. We were so excited about them. It's hilarious. But anyways, she kept the first voicemail that I, that, I, that I called her. She kept the first voicemail where I told her that I loved her. Now I said it to her face-to-face -face guys first, but, you know, <laughs> the first like voicemail where, you know, I said it on a voicemail. And I would give her such a hard time. She's like, no, I listened to those things. Like years. Years. That's what we need to do with God's word. Because he is telling us, I love you. I love you. Let me show you how much I love you. Let me let, read through all the different ways that I say I love you. And that is what we must do. And so as we go through these next steps, you see them on your, uh, the back of your bulletin. You can write, take some notes if you'd like. Uh, they're also in you version if you're following along there. Uh, but the scripture we're going to use is the same one we've been uh, talking about, uh, you know, since the beginning of, of the message. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how, it, how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's the passage that we're going to be studying in this moment. The first tool that we, uh, that, the, what, what, that we can use in Scripture is understanding the background, understanding the background of the passage. Think about it as the setting, you know, if you're thinking about a work of literature. So who's the author? Paul is the author. He is uh, he's an apostle, he was a Pharisee. He was on his way to Damascus to, to persecute Christians. And Jesus Christ showed up and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He was converted and, and Jesus said, I am going to use you to be my messenger to the Gentiles and to reach the world. He's writing to Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor who happens to be in Ephesus. Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. He's writing, the, the original language is Greek, so you can see when, when was it written? Um, probably, you know, sometime in, in the near like 60 AD time frame. Uh, what language was it written in? It was in Greek. What are the cultural implications of all of this? So when Paul says continue to Timothy, he says continue in what you have learned and been convinced of. Paul's life before he was a Christian, was a Pharisee. His entire life was about understanding the Old Testament. His entire life was taking in the law and continuing in what he had learned and been convinced of. So when Paul is telling Timothy to continue in the scripture, to continue in the understanding and knowledge of the gospel, Paul knows the dedication that he is requiring of his student because it's the same dedication that he gave. He gave his life to study God's word. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy to do. 
from a context perspective, the next tool is about context. What other parts of scripture or the chapter uh, or book can inform what this passage means? What can you do as you read around the passage that you're reading to understand more about what this particular verse or verses mean? What about other writings by the same author? So if you're writing, if you're reading a book written by Paul, what else does he write that helps you understand what he's writing in this passage? Or what about all of scripture? So often in the New Testament, we read something where they're quoting the Old Testament. Go read the Old Testament, read the original part where it was mentioned and understand more about what they're quoting because they're not just quoting the words, they're quoting the emotion and the idea that was communicated in the Old Testament as well. So examples of this, 2 Timothy is where this passage is found, which implies what? That there's a 1 Timothy. So the, the, the theme of 1 Timothy is about church organization. So Paul, uh, 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 an elder statesman in the church, if you will, writing to a young man, Timothy, this is how you organize your church. That's what 1 Timothy is about. Second Timothy is, this is how you are supposed to be a pastor. This is how you lead your church. The direction in 2 Timothy is about endurance. It's about boldness. It's about fidelity to the gospel. It's about holding yourself and others accountable. Why is this important? Because Timothy is, is the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And so if you remember at the very beginning of our series Paul wrote Ephesians. He wrote the, 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 the scripture about the armor of God to the church that Timothy is leading. And we know that in Revelation, Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus and says, you have abandoned what you did at first. Timothy is leading a church in turmoil. He's leading a church in turmoil. And so he, Paul says, Scripture is useful for teaching, leading, correcting, reproving, rebuking, and equipping the saints for God's work. He is telling Timothy, you're leading a church that is in turmoil, but use God's word. That's what he is saying. We see some, some additional context. I'll just share this with you, but this is about, in 2 Timothy 1, you can go and read it. It says, fan into flame the gift of God that you have received through the laying on of my hands. The, it demonstrates the intimate relationship that Paul had with Timothy. That this was not just something that happened over letters, that they were, they were together. Timothy was, was Paul's like understudy, basically. He was following Paul's footsteps. Paul laid his hands on Timothy and sent him out to do this work. And that he would fan the flan into flame. And the way that you fan into flame the, God, the gift that God has given is through the, the reading and understanding and studying of God's word. At the beginning of 2 Timothy 3, which is where our passage is, we see this. It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, holy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutals, not lovers of the good, uh, brutal, but not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Does that sound like any time that we might live in right now? The challenge is Paul's not talking about the world, he's talking about the church. He is telling Timothy, this is what you have to face. These are the people that you are leading. These, this is what's happening. He says, have nothing to do with such people. He's not saying to just abandon them. He's saying, don't live like them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes, gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul says, this is what you have to be, conf- this is what you are being confronted with But what is the first thing he said in the passage we're studying? But you do this. You continue in what you have learned. You continue in what you have been convinced of. So we can see that as we read around the passage that we are looking at, we begin to understand more of what is happening and the significance increases. Another tool that I love to use is about other translations. And, you know, you've heard me Um, If you've been here for any amount of time, you've heard me preach from the NIV, from the KJV, from the New Living Translation, from ESV, from Amplified, from the Message, you know, from many different translations. Um, Some 
some, some, some churches, some people will say, you can only read from the King James Version. You can only read, you know, from this one. Listen, when you, when you look at those major translations, they're all being sourced, they're all being translated from basically the same text. They're called the Masoretic Text, and they're, you know, older uh, documents that have been sourced and documented and proven to be, uh, you know, the, the foundation of Scripture. Okay, so we know, that's why we know that what we read today is true. I mean, in, in Walk Through Bethlehem, what, what is one of the things that we say at the, the synagogue? It's one of my favorite lines in all of it. Because you have the scribe, and what's the scribe's role? He is copying the scripture from one scroll to another scroll. If he makes a mistake at the very end, like if it's the last bit of punctuation, he has to burn the scroll. He would burn the scroll and start over. That's, that's the standard of perfection that they operated with so that I know that when I open my Bible or I look at the Bible that I have available to me on my phone or on my computer, I know that it's the same. I know that it's the same. And other translations can help us understand more. Uh, the Amplified translation really helps us get, like it, it takes some of the words from the original language and it increases them. It helps us see what the other words are and how that uh, grows. So it says, but as for you, continue to hold to the things that you have learned of and of which you are convinced, knowing from whom you learned them, and how from your childhood you have had a knowledge of and have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you and give you the understanding for salvation, which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. This is, I love this part. Faith in Christ Jesus. Salvation, which comes through faith. Listen to what it's, how it describes that. Through the learning or the leaning on the entire human per personality on God in Christ Jesus, an absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. That's what salvation is. The entire leaning of our human personality on God with utter trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. Says, Every scripture is God-breathed that is given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, reproof, and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline and obedience, and for training in righteousness and holy living in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action. I love that it brings out in thought, purpose, and action because those are all elements that we have to watch out for. It says it so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Another translation uh, that I like to read at times is the message. One thing that I will say about the message is it, it, is, it, it really accurately captures the emotion of what is being written. I would recommend that it is not the only translation that you read, uh, but it's a good one to read in like balance and get greater understanding of, a, of, a, of maybe the NIV or whatever you might read in addition to that. But this is the one where it says, um, in the very beginning where it says, why you took the sacred scriptures in with your mother's milk. What a beautiful picture to, to imagine that, you know, as we are teaching that or learning or, you know, being weaned, that we're also taking in the scripture with us. Another tool that's important for engaging in the word of God is questions. And why is this important? Listen, I could read all of this and I could have a thousand questions in my mind, but until I acknowledge what those questions are, I will not learn the answers to them. And so when I read, you know, this passage and, I, and it says that, you know, God's word is useful for correcting, it is useful for teaching, it is useful for rebuking, it is useful for equipping, the questions that I would want to ask myself, how do I respond to the teaching? How do I respond to God's rebuking? How do I respond to his correcting? How, I, how do I respond to his training? I'll take the teaching and the training all day. God, you just, I don't need the rest. Right? I mean, that, that, like this, is, this is the conversation that we can have with the Lord. Not that I'm going to reject that, but what it does is it helps me to realize that I'm going to chafe at his rebuking. I'm going to chafe at his correction. But then I must say to God, help me to receive them. Help me to receive them. Because God's word is useful. Its purpose is to correct me. Its purpose, purpose is to reprove me, to tell me that when I'm, when I'm outside of his will, wonderful element that we must realize. And then how do those things, how, do his, how does his training, his teaching, his rebuking, how does that equip me to do his work? These are some questions that we can ask about that one. Um, another tool, this is what we studied on Wednesday. Now Wednesday, we took one word 
and we went into a tool called Bible Hub. I'm going to put some, some of this online on Facebook, guys, so you can um, understand, and you'll have some, some notes that you can take there as well. But what it, what it does on Bible Hub is it gives you the word and then all the other places in Scripture where that word is used in the original language. We spent an hour on the word peace on Wednesday night. It was, it was amazing. But here are some words and their original meaning to help us bring some additional understanding to this passage. Where it says continue, Paul said continue in what you have learned. That continue means to stay or abide, remain, to do not leave, or more directly, continue to be present. So in John chapter 15, Jesus says that he is the vine, we are the branches, and that we must abide, we must remain in him because that's where we, uh, that's how we experience life. Paul is telling us to continue in God's word the same way. God breathed means inspired by God. The teaching is specific to a doctrine, bringing weight to what we are understanding and what is being taught, and it's alignment with God's word. Correction is about reproving, discipline. We don't like this part, exposing. What is there? Convincing with solid, compelling evidence. God doesn't really need to do a lot of convincing. Like he, I mean, we fight him, but his evidence is compelling when, he, when he's talking to us about our sin. But his word helps to, to highlight that, to reveal that truth to us, to convict us, to be proven guilty, not because he wants to condemn us or make us feel guilty or shame, rather because he wants to draw us to him. That's what that's about. Training, rearing of a child, discipline, chastisement, cultivation of mind and morals. And one of the things that I like to do is I do a word study to help me understand the scripture more, what I will do is I will replace the word with its definition. I'll replace a single word with its full definition in the scripture itself. So when Paul says, continue in what you have learned and have been convinced of, I'm going to say, stay in what I have learned and been convinced of. Abide in, remain in, continue to be present in what I have learned and been convinced of. So that's how I can, we can grain, gain greater understanding of that. Cross-reference is another wonderful tool. It's actually one of my favorite because the, the, the scripture is so full of other scripture that speaks truth and aligns with the message that we are reading. Some of you are probably wondering, hey, what about Hebrews 4.12? Like, why hasn't John talked about that yet? Because it was, we're coming on it right now. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give uh, an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This passage actually helps us to realize how two different tools can interact with one another. The first tool being cross-reference, right? So I see that uh, God's word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And God's word is breathed by God. So again, confirming that God breathes life into his word, right? So I see a cross-reference that helps me understand my original reference. But now I see that the, con the benefit of context to help me understand all of it together. How many of you have ever heard that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, separating joint and marrow, and so on and so on? How many of you have also heard that Jesus is our high priest who has been tempted in every way, but he did not sin? How many of you realize that those two things were sandwiched together? You see the importance and the, the additional significance that that brings so because Jesus understood that God's word is alive and active, it separates joint and marrow, he was able to withstand his temptation. He was able to overcome the temptation, the same temptation that you receive, the same temptation I receive, but he didn't sin because he was connected to the word of God. This is so important. And, and, and you can see the passion that I have in studying the word. Why? Because I know that it has life. I know that it gives me life. Listen, in the, in, 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 on days when I am either late reading the Bible, I can feel it. I can tell that I, have, that I have missed it, that I've missed the mark. 
I do my best that when I, you know, when I have an opportunity, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, you know, throughout my day, I want to engage in the word of God. I don't want to scroll social media. I want to scroll through scripture. I want to read it. I want to become intimate with it. As I read it and I see something that stands out to me, I, I take note of that scripture so that I can go back later and dive into that word. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I just want you to know there are many ways that you can study, many ways. You can carve time out. You can prioritize different parts of the day, but we must engage with the word of God. The last two tools are very important, but I'm gonna leave these to you alone. Paraphrase, okay? I'm not telling you to rewrite scripture. What I'm telling you is if a seven-year-old came up to you and said, what does this mean? How would you explain it to them? A couple weeks ago, for Awana, we had popcorn with pastor. Terrifying. Terrifying. Because George, I knew that George was with his class, and he's like, hey, you need to ask Pastor John this question. You need to ask Pastor John this question. But, you know, I sat in front of, you know, 30, 40 little children, and they're asking questions. And when they're asking me a question about, well, why does it say this in the Bible, or what about that? I have to change how I'm going to give that answer because they don't understand. They don't have that that, that understanding and experience, right? So if a seven-year-old were to come up to you and ask you, what does this mean? How would you explain it to them? I know that many of you have taught Sunday school. I know that many of you have have led a small group or I know that many of you have even just shared scripture with someone else. Doesn't your learning increase with the sharing? So that's what this is about. How would, you, how would you share this passage so someone else could understand what it means? And then lastly is application. Because the word means nothing if we leave it in its, sword, in its sheath. The word means nothing unless I actually apply it. Jesus said that it, the man that hears my word but doesn't act on it is like the man who built his house upon the sand. And when the storm came, when the when the when the, when the circumstance came, the sand was eroded and the man's house came crashing down. I don't want that to be my life. I want my life to be like the man whose house was on a firm foundation because he heard the word and he acted and he applied the word. One of the things that that I have found in my own life is that when I read God's word, it creates a desire to read more of God's word. I was telling uh, the first service, anybody ever remember those uh, old Folgers commercials where, you know, someone would like start brewing coffee and then the rest of the house would wake up because coffee was now magically done? I said that doesn't happen in my house because usually I'm the one that brews the coffee. It would because I love coffee, but it's bacon. I remember times where like I think Melanie was trying to get me up so I could brew coffee and she would just start bacon, like start making bacon right? And I would smell that bacon and it would get me out of bed because I was ready to have some bacon and then I would make her some coffee. But the the reason I share that with you, I know it's a little silly, but the reason I share that with you, we are told to have the aroma of Christ. I cannot live with the aroma of Christ if I don't have him in me, if I'm not intimate with who he is, if I'm not intimate with his nature and his spirit, if I'm not receiving his word into me so that I can then go and share that word with other people. Hopefully today you've, you've learned something um, and, and learned how to engage with God's word. I wanna just put this challenge out to you. What could God accomplish in this body of believers and through this body of believers? If every day, for even a month, every single one of us spent time in God's word. Can you imagine? We would be so different in just 30 days if we were united in that. I dare you. I dare you to join me every day for a month. And guess what's going to happen after that 30 days? We're going to start another challenge. We're just going to keep this going. Okay, I'm just letting you know. But we're going to take it in bite-sized chunks every day for a month. Can you commit to read God's word? Can you commit to spend some time, to 
to study it, to talk to God about his word, to let him speak to you through his word? Some questions for you today. Are you, con- are you continuing in your pursuit of God's word? That's what we all just said. You know, we're going we're gonna to get after that every day for the next 30 days. Are you living in your own strength? Or are you living in the strength of God's word? Are you open to correction and discipline? Because listen, as you read through the next 30 days, God's going to show something to you. You must act on it. And how are you going to apply it? How are you going to apply the truth of God's word? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you that through your word, you can change us. You can can, um, just transform us and then use your word to transform others through our own transformed lives. God, as we are here, help us to understand the steps that we can take to prioritize pursuit of you through your word. Help us to see the life that you want to bring to us as we bring your word into us. Help us to understand that we must take our sword and use it in battle. That we must continue down the path that we have learned and been convinced of. Show us the things in our life right now, God. We are here, we are united in prayer. Every single person, God, right now, show us the things in our life that are getting in the way that would prevent us from accomplishing this goal of reading your word every day for the next month. Show us those things. Let make it so clear in our mind right now that we know what we need to do to make a difference, to, to change, to, to reprioritize our time so that we can demonstrate you as our priority. We thank you for this, God, and we thank you for the work that you're gonna do in our life, the work that you're gonna do in our church and through our church. In Jesus' name, amen.